Hi folks, thanks to be here for this talk about the change data capture use case designing an evergreen cache. This is my first Apache Con, so I'm very, very glad to be here. I'm Nicola Frankel, I've been a developer for 20 years, mainly in Java. I taught myself Kotlin a couple of years ago, and my current of the rest is in Rust. I'm also a developer advocate. Back to our agenda. So today, this is the points I would like to make. But the first is like thinking about caching and why do we cache. Then we will see some alternatives to keep the cache in sync with the source of truth. Then I will define change data capture itself. We will see a CDC implementation called Debezium. Then we will detail how the BZM can work with a streaming platform, Hazel costs. And finally, I will trust to try to impress you with a demo. If you remember one thing from this talk is that caching is a trade-off. You might have heard that caching is a sign of a badly designed system. It's not always the case. And in general, it's not the case. Um, there are a lot of valid reasons to have and caching. So this trade-off is you accept to have stale data and in return you get fast data or available data. Well, fast data is pretty straightforward. Why available data? Imagine you have a microservice architecture. Imagine you have an e-commerce shop that is implemented through microservices. So you have a catalog microservice, you have a court microservice, you have a checkout microservice, a payment microservice, a pricing microservice. Then when you go to the checkout step, you want to have the final pricing. So you call the pricing microservice. And because it's a microservice architecture, it's a distributed architecture, there is a nominal probability that at this moment, the pricing microservice is down. So what happens? Well, you don't have caching, that means that you lose sale and the business is not very happy about that. If you have caching, you probably like cash the previous prices. So there is a chance that it's in the cash and you can return something that might be slightly wrong, but at least you won't lose a sale. And that's in general a good thing to do. So let's keep our example simple. Here we have only a single application and a database. And in between, we have a cache that acts as a fast site. So every time we do an operation, either read or write, we go through the cache. We read from the cache. When we write, we write to the cache. The cache writes to the database. That's the ideal. In general, the ideal is not there because you have a third party component that will write to the database. Uh, most of the time, it's a table that holds references and those references needs to be updated every now and then. For example, there might be a registry of all your customers or this kind of stuff. So the question, is how do we keep the cache in sync with the database? And you might have heard that there are two hard things in computer science, naming things, cache invalidation, and of course, of by one errors. Um, just if you didn't catch it, because it's an online conference, it's supposed to be a joke on site, it would be very funny, but here, well, I leave it up to you. Anyway, Cache invalidation, what is it? We need to define what is cache invalidation because cache invalidation is not only removing items from the cache. There are reasons, other reasons to remove items for the cache. And the other reason is cache eviction. There is a difference between cache eviction and cache invalidation. So it's time for some semantics. If I tell you cache, especially if you are a junior developer, your first reflex will be to implement it through a hash map. I've done it before. Hash map, associative array, dictionary, depending on your language stack. And the problem with this approach is 
uh, and the hash map is unbounded, so it, it can grow without limits, and then soon it will compete with your applications for memory, and there will be a problem for like out of memory error if you're in Java, or other errors if you are in other language stacks, and that's an issue. So, in general, that's not a great idea. You should get a caching solution from a provider, and it has multiple features, most important one, it sets the limit on the hash map. And then now the question becomes, if you reach the limit, so if your cache is completely full, and you need to put a new entry into the cache, what happens? Well, we cannot just discard this new entry, what we will be doing is we will be evicting one of the old entry from the cache. There are probably multiple strategies depending on your cache provider. The most popular one as our least recently used or least frequently used, that's cache eviction. You have your cache that is full, you need to add a new entry, you remove an old entry. And now there is another reason to remove entries is cache invalidation. Cache invalidation is the idea that when you put an entry into the cache, it's valid for some period of time. It's the time to leave. And this is very hard to infer. It depends a lot on your use case, but there is also some technological or let's say like process flow related problems. Now imagine we still have our application, we still have our batch, and the batch runs like once per hour. And if we have a TTL of two hours, that means that during one hour we will be serving data from the cache. And we know that this entry might be wrong because the patch will have been executed. That's not good. Now, we still have this like patch running every hour and we do our updates like our TTL is now 30 minutes. Now that means that we'll be like emptying the cache and we will be getting it back from the database. But we know at this time that the entry has not been changed, so we will be wasting resources. Well, that would be even easy, but it's even more complicated than that, because um, if we say that the batch runs every hour on one system, and the, the cache is in another system, how do we synchronize the clocks? because we are in the distributed systems and clock synchronization is not possible. There will always be like some degree of uh, changes. And then finally, the final nail in the coffin is that those are irregular. Like even if your batch runs every hour, you don't know when you first access the data, it will be done on the hour or just one minute or two minutes or like how many minutes afterwards. So it's near, well, it's completely impossible to choose the correct TTL on a set basis. In that case, there is only one sane solution is to be even driven. Even driven means, hey, if no right happens, then do nothing. If something happened, well, even if it's very frequently, we will update the cache accordingly. And it makes sense. Now, even driven in the database space probably like means triggers for most of you. The problem with this approach is not all database management system implement trigger. And the second issue is that most, if not all the cases of triggers they work inside the database. So something happens and you will update some tables. But here we want to call an external process. We will want to, to refresh the cache or to update the cache. And in that case, it's a bit more involved. So for this talk, I've done a bit of research and I found the case of MySQL. And it's actually possible to define a trigger that will call an external function. Of course, there are a lot of limits on, on, on this function. For example, the most important one is C++. I will infer that most of you are, are proficient in C++, but I'm not. 
I've like done six months of C++ 20 years ago and honestly after that time I, I don't want to delve into C++ anymore. And then there are a couple of other constraints. Fortunately, somebody has written a library for us so you don't need to write everything by hand. Here, for example, you have this lib mysql udf sys, which is on GitHub. You can check it. Um, and you just need to create the call that you want here, command, and then you need to call sysexec. Sysexec is the function that is provided by us. Here, of course, it's a SQL command, but it could be any uh, like process related one, and, and it will be doing that for you. That seems quite well, the solution. But then if I put on my uh, architect ads, um, I, have, I, I find a couple of issues with that. The first is it's implementation dependent. It's only in the context of MySQL. Then it's a bit fragile. There are many like uh, components that are involved. And if it breaks and it will break, who will maintain and debug it. Will, be, will it be uh, the developer? Will it be the operational team? Will it be the database team? Um, who? And if you have done triggers in the past, you, you, can, you know that they, they can be quite resource consuming if they are done frequently. Now comes this like new name called change data capture. And here you can find the definition on Wikipedia. I, I won't read it uh, to you because you can find it. Um, you can picture change data capture as the opposite of event sourcing. That's, that's the, the, the way I choose to define it, it's the opposite. So event sourcing is the idea that uh, you will store the events in your data store. And then when you want to know about the state, you will replay the events in order and you will get the state. Of course, if you have um, like a long history of events, it's not feasible. So every now and then you will take snapshots. So you don't need to replay every event, but you just need to take the latest snapshot and replay the events that happen afterwards. And that works well, in most cases, pretty well. The idea is that in that case, you need to like completely redesign your information system. Change data capture is completely the opposite. You keep storing the state, but out of the state, you will like make events. And actually, again, on Wikipedia, you will see that some of the um, change data capture implementation, you probably have use them already. Like if you do polling and you have a dedicated column, timestamp, version number or status, whatever. So you pull this and you check this status column and you update it afterwards. Now it can be categorized as a kind of change data capture. We have seen triggers, but the most recent way to do change data capture is actually log scanners. So what are log scanners? They can be called a bin log or a writer head log and um, they are uh, like compounded with databases, especially traditional SQL databases. So you might have read this article uh, from Martin Kleppmann about Apache Senza. And in this article, he makes the case for data streaming and especially the fact that uh, if we would redesign our uh, database right now, it would probably be along, hey, we have uh, like the SQL API. This is our abstraction. But then in, on the implementation side, you probably want to have replication with like one leader and at least one follower. And the idea is that as a developer, you are only interested in the SQL API. You are only interested in executing your queries or your updates or your deletes. But at some point, there is somebody from the upside that we, that, who will decide that, hey, it's important 
that we don't lose data. And then we must find a way for the follower to be in the same state as the leader. So what happens is that when the leader receives um, uh, um, a query, not a query, but a statement that changes the state of the database, the first thing that it does, it, it writes in down in a write ahead log. And so afterwards, there is probably a second process that we read this log and apply the changes. And if the followers does the same, that means that they will like execute the changes in the same order and at some point they will be in the same state. And so if the leader at this point crashes, then the follower has the same state. So this binary log or authorization log, again, write ahead log because every database has a different name for it, contain the events that change the state of the database. As I mentioned, that can be like the, the reason for that in replication can be also data recovery. Only if you have a single node, the first thing you might want to do is write it down into the log. So if the main process crashes, you can still like restart it and read from the log. So the idea is what if we hack this log for our purposes? So if we check the MySQL, it looks quite interesting. This is the MySQL bin log and you can see here that uh, you have an update where set. So that is SQL that you can understand. Of course, there is something that you also might understand if you are uh, deep into um, the database system. But then there is something that is completely unreadable. And so back to my previous issues, it's implementation dependent is like super fragile and who will maintain and debug it when it crashes? So I don't want to do that myself. Fortunately, there is a component called Debezium. And Debezium like provides you with an abstraction, with an API over this kind of stuff. It's provided by Red Hat, it's licensed under the Apache 2 license. And the first idea behind Debezium, at least when it was incepted, is you could like set it up so that every time there was a change in one of those supported databases, it would write down into a Kafka topic. And Kafka is very good because, well, it means you are storing the events in a durable way. And sometimes it's not that good because we want fast and writing to disk and then reading for to disk it's not really fast. And in that case, we want the database to reflect, uh, sorry, the cache to read, uh, to reflect the change in the database. So putting Kafka in between might not be so a good idea. Anyway, we have uh, Debezium supports a couple of databases, plugins. So there are a couple of them already like production ready and they are used. Uh, a couple of them are incubating. You can probably create your own if um, there is not the one you want. But long story short, it's a lot of the market share uh, right now, perhaps 80, 90%. I mean, start, starting with Oracle, you, you already have probably like 50%. Now we want to leverage that and as I mentioned, Kafka is a very good solution in some contexts and in the context of like uh, updating the cache, not that great. So we want something that is like fast that doesn't write to this. We just want to read from the bin lock through the Debezium and update the cache. Now we have this product called Hazelcast and Hazelcast combines uh, an in-memory key value store and in-memory stream processing engine. It's dis distributed by nature. It's also licensed into the Apache V2 license. And um, though it's not an Apache project, for example, you have the Apache Beam project that provides an abstraction layer on top of stream processing engine and Hazelcast is supported right now. 
This is how most uh, applica uh, stream processing engine work. You can read from like some uh, things, you can write to targets, and then in between you can do your transformation, whatever. Uh, and of course, here, because we also have an in-memory data store, we can enrich the events directly in memory. We don't need to read from this. There are two ways to deploy uh, Hazel costs. Uh, if you are a Java developer, it's the, the easiest one is uh, to use the embedded mode, meaning Hazel cost is just a library. You add it to your palm or to your uh, build.gradle and then you can access it. So you start the node, the Hazelcast node, when you start the application, there will be an auto discovery process that will form a cluster. This is very easy. This is very uh, comfortable. However, um, then the Hazelcast node will compete for memory with your application. And in general, if you want to start to rely on Hazelcast as uh, like a real infrastructure component, you will soon move to the client server mode. Then in that case, you will have a dedicated cluster. Then we have Docker images, we have hand charts, uh, and then you can uh, like call it from your application through the network. In that case, the really, really nice thing is that you don't need to use Java. We have uh, bindings in multiple languages, for example, Python, Golang, Node.js, uh, C++, and, and Python. And so you are free from the Java API if you don't like Java. Most, if not all, stream processing engines use those two notions of pipeline and jobs. Here I'm using uh, the Hazelcast semantics, but if you know about other stream processing engine, you can probably map them one to one. So first you will declare the pipeline, and the pipeline is just code where you say, hey, I will be reading from this endpoint, I will be writing to this endpoint, and those are the transformations I want to apply. Once you have developed that, then at runtime, you will have a client that sends that code to the stream processing engine cluster. Then the cluster will receive the pipeline and it will start to execute it. And then it becomes a job. And because it knows about the topology and probably during the pipeline, you have sets like parallelism, depending on a, this can be parallelized or not then it's able to distribute the workload among all nodes in the cluster. So now we have all the pieces, we can finally like resolve our issue. We will have our uh, application that is still reading from the cache. We will still have, have our a database that has a batch that changes the, the reference data, but we will add like a third party component, like a Hazelcast cluster that will read every time there is a change, it will be like informed about the change and it will write it into the cache. And so the application will be able every time to read from the cache and we, are, we will know that the cache is up to date or like very close to real time up to date. I've talked a lot, now it's time for me to show you some code. Here I've created an application. It's a Java application. It sh it's not necessary for it to be a Java application. It's a simple application that is based on Spring Boot. And then I have a couple of, of mappings. The first mapping is actually, I will display all entities from my database the second mapping is I will update one single entity from my database and I'm using the post redirect get so that after an update, I will reload everything. Now, I'm using that from the repository. I will fetch data and read and write data from the repository. And here I've implemented um, like two caches. The first one is the query cache. If you're familiar with Hibernate, is exactly how Hibernate works. I've re-implemented from scratch in a very, very simple way, just for demo purposes. 
the idea is that the first thing that the first cache that I have is uh, a key value store where the key is the query and uh, the value is the primary keys of um, the results. And then the second cache is the entity cache and the key is the PK and the value is the entity itself. So here you can see that I create my select and then I will get from the query cache and here in this that case, the query cache, there will be at most one row. I will check if I already have the query in the query cache. If I already uh, have it, then I will get the keys from the value and then I will directly return the keys and get them from the entity's cache. So at the end of this sequence, I will have the values that are cached. If nothing is in the cache, so if the wrapper is null, then I will like query from the database. I will create the entities, the person. I, I at, Afterwards, I will put each of them in the entity cache and I will put the query in the query cache. I have a simple Docker Compose uh, infrastructure, so I will up it now. And uh, let me show it to you. So I have my application. Uh, I have containerized my application through JIB. Um, regardless, you can do whatever you want, but JIB is very easy. I don't need to create a dedicated Docker file. So I have my application and I have the pipeline. I will show you the pipeline afterwards. This is not necessary at the moment. And here I have my database and the application looks like the following. Local hosts 8080. So here you can understand why I'm a developer and not a designer. It looks pretty bad. So here I have a couple of entities and I say, hey, here I can update some stuff and it works. And here I can update other stuff and it still works. And now I want to show you that um, when there is a batch, so here there is not a batch because it won't be very feasible. I will update data directly to the database and show you that, hey, the cache is not up to date. So I've created an application for that. It's again a Spring Boot application, but it can be anything. It's just for demo purposes. So here I can list the entities. I have to command list and update. I can list the entities. So here you can see Roberta, Chiara and Nicola, which is what I just updated. And now I can say, hey, update three with John. So normally it should replace the first name with John of the third entity. And of course, if we check, because we are reading from the cache, the, the application reads from the cache and the user doesn't know about the latest change. So what we can do is um, I have set up a pipeline and I have stopped it to show you that it doesn't work. And now what we can do is we can start the pipeline. So this is the jet job that I referred to previously at the top of the diagram. And while it starts, I can show you the codes. It's a simple, very simple application. It doesn't require Spring Boot or anything. It's just a main class, a main, main uh, sorry, a main method and the magic happens here. So a lot of stuff happens regarding configuration. For example, here, this method, like you have every primitive necessary, the rest is A, in which environment are we running and configuration. Likewise, the cache is also the same. We are configuring the stuff and the pipeline itself uh, can be read in plain English, like read from the database and don't care, care about the timestamps and just peek just to make sure that everything is working. So we will write it down to the log, map what you get to a person and then to a map entry and write back to the cache. So the only constraint is that we know, we must know which format is in the cache so that we can map it accordingly. 
And now, now if we refresh the application, we see that it has caught on the changes that were applied before it had started. And of course, now it's very easy because since this pipeline is on, uh, we can do the changes, let's say, update to with Korean. And now every time the changes will be caught on, the cache will be refreshed and our user will be happy. So a quick recap, uh, in this talk, I've shown you the caching trade-off. Caching is not bad per se, it's a trade-off. Either you want fast data or available data and you accept to have stale data. But this staleness might be an issue in most cases. So a change that I capture uh, allows you to cope with this trade-off and I've shown you how you can implement it with Hazelcast and Debezium. So thanks a lot for your attention. Here is my blog, here is my Twitter handle, uh, here is the uh, Git repository. So in case you want to go deeper into the codes, uh, well, please have a look. And if you see anything, I will be happy to receive uh, issue or comments or whatever. Thanks again for your attention and I wish you a good day.